All right, Judges chapter 16. This is the last chapter of the, the few chapters that we're reading with the story of Samson. And, um, of course, the real famous story of Samson and Delilah. Let's jump into this story here in verse number 1. The Bible reads, Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in unto her. And it was told the Gazite, saying, Samson is come hither. And they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning when it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. So right away we see, and I'm going to get into this in just a minute, in Samson's choice of women. And really this is a kind of a glaring sin for Samson. And, and as I mentioned, I'm, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, so I'll get into that in just a minute. But what we see here in the story is basically he goes in to the, the house of a harlot and he spends some time with her. And then it, these, you know, the Philistines hear that he's in town and they want to get him. And, that, you know, they're, they're after Samson. They want to, to get him. They want to kill him. They want to destroy him. So they lie in wait. They're all hiding around by the gate of the city. And they're like, as soon as it's day, as soon as he comes out, we're going to jump him. We're going to kill him, right? So he comes out at midnight. And obviously he knows they're there, which is why he just takes the whole the gate of the city. It says bars and all, just takes them, lifts them up, puts them on his shoulder, and walks up a hill and goes all the way up to the top of a hill and just like, boom, and sets them down there, just demonstrating this great strength that he has. And it's really interesting that this is just kind of included here, but I think we just see that God still, you know, with him is the power of the, the Holy Spirit is still upon him. He's been making some mistakes, but he's still got the power of God on him as long as he's remained this Nazarite unto the Lord. And um, this, of course, is we read this chapter where he loses that strength. Look at verse number 4. We'll keep reading here. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And we will give thee, every one of us, 1,100 pieces of silver. So you remember when he was first getting married to one of the Philistine women, he just makes this, this bet with them, and all they had to do was individually provide you know, a, a change of garment and a sheet. And they were willing to kill her and her father's house and burn it with fire for that. Now they've kind of upped the ante a little bit and they're, they're willing to give this woman 1,100 pieces of silver just to be able to get the information in order to bind Samson. And these people, they don't want to just kill him. Look what it says. It says that we want to be able to bind him to afflict him. They want to torture him. They want to capture him. They want to capture him alive. We want to get this guy. And think about this. This is, this is you know a man of God. This is a judge of Israel. It's supposed to be leading the, the, the children of Israel into freedom, out of bondage. He's supposed to be serving the Lord. And the Philistines, these wicked people that had the children of Israel in bondage, what do they want to do? They just want to bind him, torture him, and abuse him. And we see ultimately that's, that's what they end up doing. And the way that they do that um, was using his weakness because his real weakness was with women. His weakness wasn't with getting his head shaven. His weakness was, was with women. And this is a really, really, really important lesson that needs to be taught and that we need to learn. And we need to learn. This is a great chapter to learn it from. Because, men, you may be real strong. And you may seem real strong. But the weaker vessel of a woman can bring you to nothing. Right. When you go outside of what God has planned for a man and a woman and you start getting in with harlots and you start loving strange women and you start getting involved with women. And it says here, he just loved Delilah. It doesn't say he got married to Delilah. It sounds like he's just shacking up with Delilah. He's already shacked up with a harlot. He already married a Philistine. 
woman that, that was against God's law, something he's not supposed to do. Go, go marry an, an, an unsaved heathen woman. And we see here that he, he doesn't have very good choice in women. And not only that, he's choosing these women then that are, that are they have it out for him. They're not true. They're not faithful. Maybe that's why God instructed, hey, find someone of your people. And when he says of your people, I'm not talking about race or you know, being a Hebrew. It's talking about being a believer on the Lord. Find someone who has the same faith as you. Find another child of God. And we have that same instruction in the New Testament as well. That you're free to marry whom you will only in the Lord. That you, you, you've got lots of choices when you want to get married to someone. But make sure that you find somebody that loves God. Make sure you find someone that's a child of God. Because that's going to be important. Now, I'm not saying just because someone's saved, that means they're going to be the best person in the world, and they're just automatically going to treat you right. But hey, that's the place to start. <laughs> that's, that, that's the starting grounds. That's just like minimum criteria. Let's just make it over this bar. Are they saved? Are they a child of God? That's where you start from. But Samson loved these women who, I mean, the first one, was willing to sell him down the river right off the bat. This one, willing to sell him down the river right off the bat. Oh, 1,100 pieces. They, she wasn't even threatened with any harm. They just, oh, we'll give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Oh, 1,100 pieces of silver. Okay. And, and notice what she says. They say to her, okay, entice him and see where his great strength lieth. And by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him. Verse 6 says, And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. Word for word, she's just asking him, Okay, you know, they're asking me this, Samson, how do we do this? Right? Like, just, just right off the bat, no hesitation. She's just right out for that 1,100 pieces of silver. That's all. She, she's not even being subtle about it. She's just like, okay, what do we need to do about this? Yeah. Samson, just tell me. You know, how, how can we be bound? And, and how can you just be, you know, how are they going to defeat you? How are they going to afflict you, Samson? They want to bind you and afflict you. How is that going to happen? And just right away goes after him. And again, there's a lot of things that we could learn here about... Uh, women, his choice of women. Look at, turn if you would to Proverbs chapter 5. Keep your place here. We're going to look at some, some instruction and some wisdom from the book of Proverbs. Now what we're going to find in the book of Proverbs is instruction against the strange woman. Now many of the verses that we'll look at will be more focused on adultery. Okay, but the same principle can be applied whether or not it's specifically dealing with adultery or not. Men need to watch out for the strange women, whether you're married or not. Yeah. Amen. Okay, definitely if you're married, it's way worse to be an adulterer than it is to be a fornicator. But even if you're not married, men, watch out for the strange woman. Yeah. Amen. Don't find the Delilahs. That's not who you want to be with or marry. One or the other. Because they're not true. She's not true. She's not faithful. And what do you expect? If, and again, if you're, if you're going to be shacking around and getting involved in a relationship outside of marriage, if you're not willing to make that commitment to someone, and they're not willing to make a commitment to you, then how much can you really expect from that person anyways? How much dedication can you expect... Ladies, from a guy that's not willing to put a ring on your finger before taking you to bed. Right. How much dedication can you expect? Right. You really want him to treat you well. He's not even willing to make a promise unto you that you're going to be the only person that he's going to be with. Right. Right. Men. Men and ladies, same thing. It applies both ways. Look at Proverbs chapter 5, verse number 3. The Bible says, For the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. So this, is, this is describing the strange woman. The woman, that, it doesn't mean that they're weird. Okay, for, for strange. We use the word strange, it's just kind of like weird, or man, that girl's out there. No. Strange just means they're a stranger to you. You're not intimate with them, they're strange to you. The only person who shouldn't be a strange woman to you is your own wife. 
in, in this type of regard. That's someone you know, that's someone that you can be intimate with and, and know each other very well. Everyone else should be a strange woman to you. Now this one is, is an adulteress. This is someone who is, um, it says here, her, uh, her lips drop as in honeycomb. Honey's real sweet, right? It's, it's real enticing. So she's going to say things that are, that are real nice. Her mouth is smoother than oil. She's trying to butter you up. She's trying to say all the nice things to, to win you over and to try to win your heart. It says here in verse 4, But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Watch out for the trap. Because that's what it is. What's she doing? She's trying to bait you. And at the end is destruction. Verse number 5, Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. This is a strong warning. A very strong warning. Talking about her steps take hold on hell? Yeah. I don't know about you, but I don't want to get anywhere close to hell, right? Obviously, this isn't talking about your soul going to hell because you're not saved. This is just in reference to how bad this can be in your life. Right. When you shack up with a strange woman, look at verse number six. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. The ways of Delilah seem pretty movable. With her mouth, she's, she's saying how much she loves Samson. I'm sure, right? Telling him how great he is, how strong he is. Oh, what a great man you are. And at the same time, she's working with the Philistines to, to just basically get him bound up and tortured. Her ways are movable. She's willing to sell him out just for some silver. There's no real integrity there. There's no real love there. She'll do whatever for money. Watch out for that. Watch out for that attribute. Watch out for that trait. I don't care how good looking a person is. Beauty is vain. That's only skin deep. Don't worry about that. Worry about what's on the inside. And kids, listen up too. This is important. When you're going to be looking for somebody one day to get married to, these are the traits you need to be looking for and watching out for. Verse number 7 Hear me now therefore O ye children And depart not from the words of my mouth Remove thy way far from her And come not nigh the door of her house Lest thou give thine honor unto others And thy years unto the cruel Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth And thy labors be in the house of a stranger Basically, he's saying you're going to lose everything that you work for. All of your honor is going to go on to other people. All the years that of your life are going to be cruel unto you. Strangers are going to be filled with your wealth. Why? Because this woman, this strange woman is going to bring you to nothing. It's going to make you lose everything and just go to other people. It says in verse 11, And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. These are also the type of women that will carry disease. Because you're not special. Because they're not saving themselves for you. Because they're going off with any guy that they can find. Anyone they could entice. And then move on to the next mark. And, what, and there are people out there like this. That's why the Bible warns us about them. And that's why you have to be very careful who you're going to be spending any time with, who you're going to be dating, and especially who you're going to be marrying. Look at uh, verse number 12 and say, How have I hated instruction in my heart, despised reproof, and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. He's saying, you don't want to find yourself in this position when it's too late. And then be kicking yourself going, why didn't I listen to people who are trying to teach me? Why did I roll my eyes in church when the pastor who has wisdom is trying to instruct me about these people? Why couldn't I just listen? Why did I just let myself be deceived by this guy because he was so good looking? Or this girl because she was so good looking? Oh, Pastor Burson doesn't even know what he's talking about. My parents don't know what they're talking about. These people in my life, they're trying to warn me. They don't know what they're talking about. Amen. 
And then you end up going through the hardship, going through the mourning, going through the destruction because you didn't listen. Because you refused the instruction. Don't refuse the instruction. Samson, I'm sure, was kicking himself for refusing the instruction when they plucked out his eyeballs. When they bound him with chains. When they shaved off his head. An entire lifetime of being a Nazarite unto God, separated, holy. That hair that was growing, had been growing since birth, marking the entire time that was spent of him being wholly dedicated unto God. Gone in one instant. Gone in one night. Gone with one bad decision. Gone. Ruined. Flushed down the toilet. For what? I guarantee you it was not as good as he thought it would have been to be shacking up with Delilah considering the cost considering the loss how much longer could he have judged Israel who knows he judged Israel for 20 years but he just had that weakness and gave into it and made these poor decisions when it came to women turn to Proverbs chapter 6 you're in chapter 5 just flip over to chapter 6 we're going to start reading verse number 23 And again, you know, these truths and these principles can be applied both ways. There's a lot of character traits that we're going to see. Now, some of them you'll see may be more common in women over men or men over women, but you still can get the same teaching and apply it to your life, apply it to whether you're a man or a woman. And especially, you know, if you're a woman, don't be this kind of woman. Don't be like the strange woman. Don't be like the Delilah. Don't be like these women who are just willing to sell out their man for whatever, for money. Have some integrity. Be be the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31. And men, watch out. Watch out for the harlots. Watch out for the strange women. Proverbs 6, look at verse number 23. And don't keep with whores. Verse number 23, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and reproofs of instruction are the way of life to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. We're we're, going to see one more place as well. We're going to keep reading here in Proverbs 6. But you're going to notice the same attributes in Proverbs 5, Proverbs 6, Proverbs 7. All three chapters are giving us warnings about the strange woman, and they all line up. Three times we're having the same things repeated over and over again. You know what that means? Pay strong attention to these qualities. Pay a lot of attention to these attributes because God's really trying to hammer something home into our thick skulls that we can just pay attention and learn something from this. Why? Because God knows our flesh. God knows the strength of the lust of the flesh. God knows how men can be easily duped. And when some beautiful woman on the outside, that outward appearance, she starts batting her eyes and telling you how great you are, how men just are suckers for that and make horrible decisions with their life because they don't see the trap because they haven't been in God's word enough, because they can't see that and go, whoa, I'm staying away from her. Whoa, I'm having nothing to do with this woman, whether you're married or not. The woman that just comes up to you and uses flattery. I'm not talking about a compliment. We're talking about flattery. Just over the top, crazy. And you know what, women? If you don't have evil intent, first of all, you shouldn't have evil intent. And if you don't have evil intent, don't be acting like someone who does have evil intent. Watch out for the flattery. You don't need to flatter a man in order to win him over. Don't do it. Because then you're going to look like an evil woman. You give a compliment. Be nice, but you know what? Let them pursue you. Verse number... 
26. For by means of a horse, and this is why, four. Four by means. So watch out for these things. Don't lust after her beauty. Don't let her take you with her eyelids. Watch out for the flattery, for by means of a whorish woman, and you know what that's saying? That these attributes are attributes of a whorish woman. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. The wicked woman, the strange woman out there that's an adulteress, it's a game to her, it's a sport to her. And especially, Christian men, watch out for this, because you're a high prize. You're a trophy if you have any type of standards or integrity. Oh, wow, that's going to be a little bit harder. Yeah, the adulteress, she's not going to care about the guy that's just some whoremonger that's just going to to sleep around anyways. It's a game to them. It's sport to them. No, no, I want to find find that good guy and ruin him and destroy him and then move on to another one. And you think they care about you and love you. Not according to scripture. If you're wise, you'll listen up. Amen. And men, don't, don't destroy a marriage. Don't, don't throw away years and years of what you built with your spouse, with your wife. For some fling with some floozy, with some whore. Amen. Just because she's dressed up and dialed up and, and is appealing to, your, to the lust of your flesh. Let these words sink in. Memorize these passages. Hey, this is important. This, may, this is one of the most simple, basic truths that everybody in here has probably already heard a bunch of times. Yet, you know what? People are still committing adultery. Don't let it destroy you. Let's take heed unto God's word. The warning continues. Verse 27. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her, shall not be innocent. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he's hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman... Lacketh understanding, he that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. So he's saying is, you know, you play with fire, you're going to get burned. And this is a fire you don't want to play with, because especially in this case, it's talking about adultery. If you're going to lie with another man's wife, Saying he's comparing this first of all just to someone who steals. Someone steals bread from you, someone steals from you, they transgress against you. You know, people get mad about that. But there's a way of making that right. You can just say, you know what, you stole from me, now you owe me seven times as much. But they pay you seven times as much and it's done. Done. Justice is served, and you can move on, and you don't even have to you don't even have to go on hating that person. Fine. They you know. They paid me seven times for all my troubles for what they stole. And and it evens out and it balances out. And yeah, yeah, that guy that stole, they end up could lose their whole, you know, all their substance, everything they even had, because they made that stupid mistake of stealing. But at least there it's just, you know, everything could be done and paid for. But when you when you steal a man's wife, you can't make up for that. That man's not gonna be satisfied by, by paying sevenfold. You can't pay sevenfold. Right. Yep. You know, the only thing that's gonna satisfy him is blood. Right. He's just gonna to wanna to see you dead. And that's why the Bible's saying, you know what? You lack wisdom. Right. You lack understanding. Yeah. Because he that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. It says, For jealousy is the rage of a man, therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many, many gifts. He said, it doesn't matter how much you want to pay him. He said, oh yeah, look, I'm sorry, how much can I give you? He can't give me anything. You laid with my wife. That's my wife. Right. And, and don't say, oh, well, she, she came on to me. She wanted me. 
Tell that to her husband. See how, see how well that goes. Right. See, see if that calms them down a little bit. Right. Oh, but you don't understand. She, she's the one who started it. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what happens. And the Bible's not even saying that it would be right for him to kill her, although the Bible does say that adulterers get the death penalty. Right. But it's still just saying you're stupid if you do that. If you commit that sin because you're just transgressing against your own soul and you're going to wind up dead. All of the results of that strange woman, the adulteress that's seeking and hunting after the precious life. Proverbs chapter 7. Look at Proverbs chapter 7, verse number 10. The Bible says, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth and wait at every corner. What was Delilah doing talking with the Philistines, first of all? What was she doing hanging out with them? What was she doing having these conversations where they can offer 1,100 pieces of silver? We definitely know she was stubborn. We're going to get to that in a minute, how she just, just wouldn't let it go and vexed Samson's soul until he wanted to die because he's asking, she's asking him over and over and over again, well, how can, you be, how can you become weak, Samson? Just let me know. How can you become weak? Come on, Samson, tell me. If you love me, you tell me. Can you just tell me, Samson? Come on, tell me. Just over and over and over again. You don't really love me. If you love me, you tell me how you can become weak. You tell me why you're so strong. You tell me how this could happen. You tell me how other people can defeat you, Samson. Sounds stubborn. This is who the Bible is warning us about. Verse 13, So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Sounds real spiritual, huh? The adulteress. Sounds real spiritual. Oh, hey, I just paid my vows. I'm just coming from church. She walks into this guy. Oh, hey, I'm just on my way home from church. Why don't you come home with me? She catches them and kisses them. Hey, I've been looking for you. I'm just, I, I was at church. I've got my peace offerings. I paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. She doesn't know who it is. This is just some guy that she's walking up to. Verse 16, And I, I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. Yeah, they're trying to, to pretty up sin. Trying to pretty up the picture. Yeah, they call it love instead of fornication. Love instead of adultery. Love instead of whoremongering. Amen. Love instead of being a harlot. Love instead of filth and abomination when it comes to the sodomites, right? Love wins. No, that's filth. That's not love. And and girls, when the, you know when 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 the guy that you're dating wants to to say, oh, let's let's you know, I love you and I want to show you I love you. Well, if they want to commit fornication, that's not love. They don't love you. If they love you, they'd wait. If they love you, they'd put a ring on your finger and wait until they say, I do, and then they can show you that they love you. Amen. That's real love. Don't be deceived by anything different. Men, don't be deceived by this woman. Oh, come, let's, let's have our share of love. That's not love. You know why it's not love? Because it's going to destroy you. Verse 19, For the good man is not at home, he has gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him, and will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasted to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, you children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. This isn't talking about this one individual woman. It's this type of woman. 
Many strong men have been slain by her. Even Samson. Don't think that you're so strong that this can't happen to you. Don't think that you're so spiritual that this can't happen to you. Put up the safeguards in your life. Don't put yourself in positions of being alone with strange women, with women that are not your wife. Don't say, well, I'm Mr. Spiritual. I'm, I've got Samson's spiritual strength. The power of the Lord's upon me. I'm winning souls. I'm memorizing scripture. I'm going to church. And then allow yourselves to be put in a situation for your lust of your flesh to take over and to be taken captive by a woman who's hunting for the precious life. Watch out for it. Don't allow it to happen. Because you will be destroyed like Samson was destroyed. And I think that's some of the symbolism we get from Samson. We see his great might and his great strength, but how quickly taken away, gone, brought to nothing. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves lest you fall. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And then verse 27 says, Her house is the way to hell going down to the chambers of death. Same exact imagery that we saw in Proverbs chapter 5. These are important lessons to learn. Samson plays them out for us in these chapters as he's going unto the Philistine woman to marry her and then going unto the harlot and then with this woman Delilah another Philistine woman and just, and just shacking up with these women let's go back to actually turn real quick um, back to Proverbs or turn forward to Proverbs chapter 19 I brought this up, but there's a couple more. As long as we're in Proverbs, I just want to get this out of the way. Because in Judges chapter 16, in verse 16, the Bible reads, And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. And ladies, I want to point this out especially. Not to be like Delilah here and just be pushing and bugging and nagging and bugging and bugging and bugging and bugging and bugging, and bugging, and bugging so that you're making your, your husband's or your, you know, your man's soul vexed unto death. That's not, a, that's not a good way to have a relationship when your husband wants to die. Wants to die because of the amount of nagging. And it's not just in Judges 16. Okay? Look, this isn't just my words. Let's read it from God's word. Proverbs 19, verse 13. A foolish son is the calamity of his father, and the contentions of a wife are a continual dropping. A contention is some type of a striving, right? You have, you have a contention. And it's just this constant... And a contention, you know, the nagging is a contention because you've already probably said no. Or you've already just said, I'm not going to do this, or whatever whatever the case may be. And it's, oh, come on, oh, just, you know. That's a contention. Yep. That's a not being respectful for what was said. And the contention is a continual dropping. Turn to Proverbs chapter 27. And we're going to get a little bit more imagery on this continual dropping. It's just this... It's like a torture. That's what a dropping is. Imagine just, just, it's just over and over again. Everything's quiet. It's a drop, 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 and just never stops. It just keeps going. It's enough to drive you crazy. It's enough to make your soul vexed unto death. And that's what it's likening to a content, you know, the contentions of a wife or as a continual dropping. Proverbs 27 verse 15 says a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. It's not pleasant. It drives you nuts. Okay. 
Now, I'm making a little bit light of this, but at the same time, it is, it is serious. It's something to be um, remembered and, and looked upon and applied to yourself just in general. I mean, look, nobody's perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. Of course, we know that, but let's strive to be better. And, you know, women are supposed to be in subjection to their husbands. That's what the Bible says, that, that, the, that the, the man is the head of the woman. The husband is the head of the household. And he's the one that makes decisions. And, you know, it doesn't say that the husband has to be right all the time in order for the woman to be in subjection and to listen and to obey her husband. It just says to obey. The Bible actually says women obey your husbands in all things. In Ephesians chapter 5, it says in all things. It doesn't say in some things or just certain things. It says in all things. The Bible actually says that as the church is subject unto, the Christ, unto Christ, so let every woman be subject unto her, unto her own husband. So just as much as our church ought to be following the leadership, the headship, the authority of Jesus Christ himself, I mean, is there any room for error in that? Is there any room of just saying, well, you know, we, we should kind of follow Christ. No, of course not. <laughs> we need to be in line with absolutely everything Jesus Christ says. And we're not going to disregard something that Jesus says for our church to be doing. That's how much gravity there. I mean, that's not even a question. Shouldn't even think otherwise. Well, in that same like manner, that's how women should be towards their husbands at home. That, that's the Bible. Read Ephesians 5 when you go home. Read it for yourself later. See if that's what it says. Test me on this. And I'm not saying you can't have a disagreement within a marriage. Of course you could disagree. No one's expecting you to agree with everything that your husband says or does. But there's a difference between disagreeing and disrespecting. I've worked for many people, and this is a good way of likening this. Because when I go to a job where I have an employer, there is an authority structure there. Where I am the employee and he's the boss. I am the servant, he's the master. I have a job to do. And I'm supposed to do that job. Now, my boss may tell me to do something that I disagree with. I may think there's a better way of doing it. But if he says, this is what I want you to do and this is the way I want you to do it. You know what? I'm employed by him and I need to do it the way that he said to do it. And if I decide just to, you know what? I know better. I'm going to do it my own way. That's disrespecting my boss. I would be surprised if my boss didn't get really angry and discipline or even fire me because I didn't listen and and follow what they said to do. Because I'm acting outside and and being rebellious to my authority. Well, apply that to marriage. It's the same thing. And it doesn't matter if, if my way is better. That's not the point. It's disrespectful to go against the commands that were given to you by your authority. We have examples of people in the Bible thinking they have a better way of doing things and God ends up killing them. Look at the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. Look at at when they decided to offer strange fire. You say, but their heart was in the right place. They're trying to serve the Lord. They came up with this different concoction of incense to, to offer that before God. God didn't say that that's what they're supposed to do. He said, no, this is how you do it. And they lost their life. Why am I preaching this? Because I want you to have a good marriage. Look, it's not because I hate women. I love women. I love men and women. And I think that we should be in the proper roles that God has designed for us. And I think if we could follow those roles, I think if we could follow what God has told us to do, we will have joy. We will have peace. We will be walking in the Spirit and enjoy the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, long-suffering. You will enjoy all of that. Again, test me on it. Try it. I'm not saying it's always easy. I'm not saying it's easy to, you know, completely submit yourself. I mean, how easy is it to completely submit yourself unto God? It's not that easy. And men, we need to remember that with our spouses. Because we're commanded to love our wife as Christ loved the church. 
How much forgiveness and leeway have you gotten through Jesus Christ? How much leniency have you received? Remember that when you're at home with your wife who's imperfect just like you. And give them that grace. Give them the long suffering and love them as you love yourself. Love them as your own body. And if husbands and wives can follow these commandments, what a great happy marriage you can have. It's very simple. It's a very simple rule. Women respect your husbands. Husbands love your wives. That's it. It's a simple formula. And what do we get in the story of Samson and Delilah? Well, here's what we get. We get with Samson. Samson's lying and mocking his, his Delilah. His Delilah, whatever. Because he's not his wife, right? His concubine, his girlfriend, whatever she is. He is. He's mocking her. When she's asking him all these times, well, hey, yo, well, here's what you do, right? And if you... If you, if you bind me with ropes, have never been used by a brand new ropes, then, then, you, then you'll, you'll get me and I'll be weak like any other man. It wasn't it was. He's lying to her. Right. He's mocking her. And you know what? That's not loving. Right. It may be kind of funny to read in the story, but that's not loving. Yeah. The Bible says that when, when you lie... The, and and I, I don't have it memorized, it's on the tip of my tongue, but basically the, the lying lips hateth um, the, who is afflicted by it. The person who is afflicted by the lying tongue, his soul hateth. Man. You don't hate the person you're lying, you're, I mean you don't love the person you're lying to, you hate them. Yeah. You're not telling them the truth. So we don't have the love from Samson and we also don't have the respect from Delilah because she dead sure isn't respecting the guy when she's just trying to get information out of him to go turn him over into some other guys and have him destroyed and tortured. It's exactly a totally dysfunctional relationship. And you know what? I don't know what else you can expect when you've got two people who aren't willing to make a commitment to each other anyways and just have these relationships outside of marriage can't rely on anything. Let's go back to Judges chapter 16. We're going to skip over because we're getting a little bit shorter on time and there's still some more I want to get to. Basically in, in verse 6 she, she just keeps asking him well how you know where does your strength lie? How can you be bound and afflicted? And he, you know, he starts off, he says, well, seven green widths that were never dried, then I'll be weak. And then she does that, of course. She makes him go to bed, and then, and then she binds him with whatever it is that, she, that he said that would uh, make him weak. And then she wakes up and says, Samson, the Philistines be upon you. And he just gets up, and it's like nothing. She's like, of course, it doesn't even work. So then uh, this happens three times. And that's when she really lays into him. And it says, let's jump down to um, verse 16. Of course, this is what I was talking about. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head. For I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Now, and look what says in verse 18. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. She actually had an opportunity to still not go to the Philistines. What a cold-hearted woman. She knows. She's like, I know he told me the truth now. He just unloaded and opened up his heart unto her. And she's just like, Philistines? Yeah, bring the money. I got it. Watch out. She's a cold-hearted woman. Watch out for, the, for these people. Verse 19, And she made him sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. 
and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. She began to afflict him. Taken away his strength. Verse 20, she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. So he gets up like there's nothing wrong. Well, I'll just go what I normally do and, and it'll be just fine. I'll shake myself at him and scare him and make him all run away. He didn't know that, that the Lord was departed from him. Verse number 21. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass and he did grind in the prison house. This is the result of Samson's sin. Samson had a problem looking on the wrong women. And this is what happens when you get involved with sin. It's just like we see it's exact same formula that we see take place with every sin. Just like with Achan, what happened? He saw the Babylonish garment. He saw the silver. He saw the gold. He coveted after them. And then he sinned and he took them and he hid them in his tent, right? And then he was destroyed. Samson saw these women and he lusted after them and he coveted after them and went in unto them. And in the end, what happens? Well, now his eyes got pulled out of his head. That alone, I mean, even just trying to think about that, like imagining that happening to you turns my stomach. Yep. Ugh. Wouldn't have happened if he wasn't shacking up with these with these women. It came back around upon him. This is a real consequence to sin. It's so easy to forget about that and to not ever even think about or consider it when the girl you know flashing her eyes at, her, at you. When the wicked woman is, is enticing you. And she's dressed in her low-cut top and trying to just, to just appeal to your flesh. The next time you find yourself in a situation like that, think of your eyes being pulled out of your head. Yeah, right. right. I'm not kidding. Yeah, right. Think about your eyes being yanked out of your skull. The next time you think you might be tempted by some adulterous woman or some whoremonger woman that's, that's, that's trying to entice you. Because that's what's going to happen one way or another if you decide to go down that path. Amen. It will destroy you. I don't think any of these women would have been worth it for Samson to say, yeah, I, I don't mind losing my eyes. And then being bound. And then just in this forced labor grinding. Being mocked and ridiculed and they just used them for sport. Blind. Bound. Because that's what sin will do to you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to bring you into bondage. Yeah, that's, right. that's exactly what happened to Samson. Right. He's blinded. He's in bondage. And now he's just working for other people. Brought to nothing. And his wealth, other people, you know, at least if you're working, you should be able to, to reap your own rewards. Nope, not when you're in bondage, not when you're working for someone else, not when you're just grinding. He didn't get any of that. How low he was brought. He didn't take heed to himself. He had a lot of strength. But he lost that in an in a instant. Verse 22. Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. And this is another important truth to remember. And this is this is the mercy of God. You may have done things in your past that you're ashamed of. You may have been brought really low like Samson. You may have made all these mistakes and screwed up your life and had your eyes pulled out or whatever, right? And this already happened. What do you do from that point? Well, you still got to move forward. 
Samson was a child of God. You can't lose your salvation. He's a child of God. Yeah, he'd been disobedient. Yeah, he ended up reaping what he sowed. But you know what? You've got to move forward. And there's hope. If, if you're still alive and still breathing, and you're a child of God, you can still be used of God. You can still do things. You can still end up doing another great work for the Lord. Don't let your whole life just be so flushed down the toilet that you just give up. The hair of his head began to grow again. Yeah, he was shaven. Yeah, it was a sin. Yeah, everything you know, got screwed up in his life. But it could come back. It could start to come back. It will never be the same as it was. Right. You can't just get back what you had, but you know what? You can move forward again. And you can move forward to doing what's right. You can move forward to the point where God can use you again. Hey, the Spirit of the Lord departed from it. But you know what? The Spirit of the Lord came back. He was humbled. He was brought low. He was brought where he needed to be to then get back and to get right with God. Allow yourself to know this. I mean, it, this has already happened, or maybe this happens in the future, or whatever. God forbid it happens in the future. But understand that even after you may ruin your life, there's always some hope that God can use you. Always hope for that. Let's keep reading here. It says in verse number 23, Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their God, and to rejoice. For they said, Our God hath delivered Samson our enemy into our hand. And when the people saw him... And look, and see, did Dagon do anything for these people? No. Dagon's not a real God. Dagon's a devil. Dagon's fake. Dagon's an idol. But when you are a Christian and you fall this hard, you are allowing for situations like this to even happen. You're allowing for these people now to have that much more faith in their idols. You're allowing for your God's name to be brought through the mud. You're allowing for them to say, oh yeah, the Lord, how powerful is he? Dagon's a lot more powerful than the Lord is. Look at what happened. See, we got Samson. Now, none of that is true, but by your fall, by his fall, he's allowing for that to even happen. He's allowing for that, for that bad name to be brought unto Christ, and shame on us if we're the ones that allow that to happen. Yeah. And notice how the, these results, the ramifications of sinful actions just get compounded. It's just worse and worse and worse. I mean, that probably wasn't a thought for him at all, that they would even be, be have the opportunity to say things like that because he's going after these women. That thought never occurred to him. And usually, all of the ramifications of sin, people don't even think about that when they're in the midst or just about to get, to get involved with that sin. None of that stuff is a, is a concern. When, the people des- when, when someone decides... Yeah, I'll go to that party and, and everyone's getting drunk or doing drugs and, and you show up and, you know, at the beginning of the night, no one thought anything bad was going to happen. You weren't planning on going out, getting wasted, and then getting behind the wheel and then smashing into someone and ending somebody's life. None of the people that get in those accidents were planning on doing that the night that happened. Right? Not even considering the pain and the hurt and the suffering that other people then have to face as a result of your sin and your actions. Be mindful. Take heed lest you fall because when you fall, you're going to... That sin just just continues and, and does worse and worse and worse. There's so many other ramifications. So many other people get hurt by the things that you can choose to do. Your life is a series of choices. Every day you have a choice to make. Use this book as your instruction for those choices. And you will not go wrong. Let's finish up the chapter here. Verse number 25. And it came to pass... 
when their hearts were merry, that they said, Call for Samson that he may make a sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport. And they set him between the pillars. So basically, they're, he's just entertainment for them. That's what I mean, make them sport. Just, yeah, come on, Samson, entertain us. Mighty Samson, they're mocking him, right? Oh, everyone was so scared of Samson, now look at him. Verse number 26, And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. So now he's asking this, this young um, this boy that's here, this lad, he's saying, you know, because he's blind, he's like, can you just guide my hand onto these pillars? Like, I'm weary. I, I need to get some rest. Can you please help me and put my hand on the pillar? And the Bible's telling us now, there's this, there's all these people here. So the lords of the Philistines. So there's all these powerful people, right? All these politicians, all these lawmakers, all these rich Philistines are gathered together in the place. And it's got to be a pretty big place. It says there's like 3,000 of them there. It's a lot of people. There's a lot of people. It's a pretty big assembly hall to have 3,000 people there. And they're all watching. And, you know, they, they all bought their tickets to see Samson, the mighty Samson, making sport for us. Verse 28, And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand and of the other with his left. This is an excellent image here. Well, here, let me go verse number 30. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. So he's got the pillars, right? And you've probably all seen images of this because it's such a, a, such a great scene, right? Where he's got the pillars on both sides, and with his last ounce of energy is asking God, God, please just strengthen me. Allow me to do this one thing. Allow me to get vengeance on them. Allow me to avenge them for my eyes. And we see a picture of him with his arms going out like this, which is a picture of Christ. Right. Of Christ's death. Right. Samson was sacrificing himself in order to free, ultimately free the children of Israel from the bondage of the Philistines. Because even though this time while Samson has been you know, judging Israel, the Philistines were still powerful and they were still ruling over them and he wasn't able to completely free them from that bondage. But through his death, when he killed these 3,000 Philistines, that was enough to then set the people free. And that is the picture, the imagery of Jesus Christ dying on the cross in order to set us free from the bondage of our sins. What a great picture that is. And one last point on this whole story. Notice, what did Samson do though? Samson killed himself. If you do something that you know is going to cause you to die... That's suicide. You're killing yourself. He's knowingly killing himself. God gave him the strength to do it. God allowed him to do it. And this is a great example of how, and, and we know that Samson went to heaven. He's listed in Hebrews chapter 11, in the great faith chapter, where the Bible is listing off all these people have had faith. Old Testament, New Testament. Proving you can't lose your salvation. Even suicide. Suicide is a wicked sin. It's a bad sin. But see, God allowed this to happen. You could say, oh yeah, but he had a cause. Yeah, he did have a cause. He did. He absolutely did. And he wanted to kill these people. But he still ended up killing himself. And see, he got himself in this situation. He got himself into a bad situation. You know what would have been way better? Is if Samson didn't mess around with these women and Samson was able to judge Israel and then go into battle and just wipe out all the Philistines and then not die himself and not have to do a, be like a suicide bomber going in to take out all these people. He could have just gone and done it the right way. And you know what? God would have been with him and he seemed to have a lot of strength. I mean, he seemed to be able to... Remember when he had the jawbone of an ass? Doesn't seem like he really needed that much either in order to have great victories. He should have done it the right way. But you know, he screwed up. He screwed up, but God was still able to use him.
And at the end of the day, even through all his faults, even through everything that he's done, even through a suicide, he's still in heaven. He's in heaven today. He didn't lose that. Why? Because you can't lose your salvation. Because once God has given you a free gift, it still is a gift. And it's still eternal. And it still lasts forever. And the only reason why people think that suicide is the one thing that a person can do to lose their salvation is because they're believing a false gospel that would teach you that you have to repent of your sins and say, oh, well, once you sin, you have to say you're sorry. And the reason why people think you can't go to heaven if you commit suicide is because they say, well, once you commit suicide, you can't say sorry for that. Right? You've already done it, so you can't say you're sorry. Well, you know, guess what? Saying you're sorry isn't what saves you. Jesus Christ is what saves you. He's the one who died on the cross. Once you receive eternal life, it's forever. That, you, that happens one time. You're born again. Amen. Suicide doesn't change that. That's right. Nothing can change that. Nothing can pluck you out of Jesus' hand. Nothing can pluck you out of the Father's hand. Amen. Nothing. Amen. Praise God. What great truth. So lot, lots of great learning from here. Let's learn from Samson's life. Let's learn what to do and what not to do. Let's be better... Husbands and wives. Let's take heed to what the Bible says. And no matter how lifted up you may feel because you are on a high and your spiritual walk with God and you are feeling stronger than ever, take heed lest you fall. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all of the wisdom that's found within the pages of this precious book, Lord. I pray that you would please help us all to... Um, take these words and to apply them, to remember them, to be meditating on them, Lord. Every day, let us use these words as our instruction to guide our feet and help us to make the good choices and how we ought to live our life. Lord, please, please, please be with us, help us, and uh, strengthen us, dear God. Strengthen us even though we're in these weak, sinful bodies, Lord. Strengthen our spirit. Help us uh, be guided in the right path. God, we love you and we thank you so much for saving us and for giving us such great instructions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.